Good morning, friends. I am indeed very honored and privileged to have my dear friend, Eddie Bai, with us. Hi, Eddie. Good morning. Good morning, Punacha. And uh, it's fun uh, to really be connecting uh, during these times to really have, uh, want to say hello, namaste, uh, to have this albeit non-virtual connection. Um, and two is to, dis to discuss topics that are really relevant and important today. Uh, how we together as a, can create community and Sangha and help each other during these uh, very troubled and adverse times, emotionally, socially, physically, as, as a society, we are going through a lot of changes. So be before I get into that conversation, I wanted to kind of just give people who are listening today, Eddie, Eddie Stern requires no introduction. You know, he is the world renowned yoga teacher. He is, a, I would say, a scholar in the pursuit of Sanskrit and philosophy, the go to person when it comes to really connecting yoga, the science of yoga, and really bringing in the research and rigor into really understanding what this ancient science has been, uh, how it can help us in society, society today. Obviously, he's trained uh, uh, very famous people in yoga. I won't basically get into that. He's trained under uh, Patabi Joyce, now also worked under Sharad Joyce in Mysore. And as his contributions to society are even bigger, he has started initiatives like Urban Yogi to help the community, uh, teaching people the educational yoga program like Set Reset. He's author of the book, One Simple Thing, and this is the book I really love. So if people really want to go back and add a book to the reading list, I highly recommend it. Because he really sheds light on the one thing, the one simple thing we can all do to really to reset ourselves, to release us, relieve ourselves from stress and anxiety, which is breathing. And he also has a free app on the app store called the Simple Breath, the breathing app. And I think I recommend everybody to download it. And uh, so before we get into all that, let's really, you know, I received an email over the weekend and it really touched me in many different levels. And I want to kind of use that maybe to have a conversation today. And the title was what really got me. What we are prepared to give. What we are prepared to give. So I want to kind of... Uh, Eddie, by maybe get into the email, uh, your thought process, and just maybe walk us through that process. We can have a conversation on that. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me on your show, Punacha. Um, you're, I'm such a big admirer of everything you do. And when it comes to service, you know, you, you lead the way. I mean, uh, we all look to you as the embodiment of the, of the spirit of Hanuman. You know, you're just out there giving and serving you, all the time. So. Uh, you know, to you, we look for guidance. Um, yeah, that, so that email um, was sparked by a conversation you and I had last week about the nature of the world and where we might be headed um, from the learnings that could come out from the coronavirus and all of the lockdowns and shelters in, in place. And um, I, um, you know, when we were talking about it, I felt I had taken a slightly pessimistic Point of view, which was that, um, you know, while there might be a big global shift in consciousness, there are a lot of people suffering also. And, and we have to like hold that at the same time to remember that compassion piece. And then my friend Vivek Menon from Mumbai sent me this great anonymous piece that um, was about basically how we are not in the same boat with this virus, um, but we are in the same storm. And everyone's boat is going to be a different kind of a boat and a different kind of a journey. And some people's boats are going to be um, filled with all sorts of privilege and other people's boats are going to be taking on water ferociously. And, um, and so to not judge either, but to hold both of that in our hearts uh, as we move forward. Is it possible for you to, do you, have the, do you have that anonymous piece with you? Can you read it for us or? Uh, or? Yeah, I can open it up, definitely. Yeah. I think I, it'll be good to have that little bit of, I, when I read it, albeit anonymous, I found it, you know, it really hit, it struck a chord, right? Yeah. And it'll be great if you can read that because yeah. I, love, I love the title, we are not in the same boat, but yeah. we are in the same storm. Yeah. And everybody has different realities. They're coming from different space, uh, space, mindset, mind space, social conditioning. So how we even look at the same adverse situation is very different, right? Yeah. So we can't just take one brush and you know, paint it all. So if you don't mind. No, here we go. Um, I heard that we are in the same boat, but it's not like that. We are in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Your ship can be shipwrecked and mine might not be, or vice versa. 
For some, quarantine is optimal, moment of reflection, of reconnection, easy in flip-flops with a whiskey or tea. For others, this is a desperate crisis. For others, it is facing loneliness. For some, a peace, a rest time, vacation. Yet for others, how am I going to pay my bills? Some have experienced the near death of the virus. Some have already lost someone from it. Some are not sure their loved ones are going to make it. And some don't even believe this is a big deal. Some of us who are well now may end up experiencing it. And some believe they are infallible and will be blown away if or when this hits someone they know. Some have faith in God and expect miracles during 2020. Others say the worst is yet to come. So friends, we are not in the same boat. We are going through a time when our perceptions and needs are completely different. And each one will emerge in his own way from that storm. Some with a tan from their pool, others with scars on their soul for invisible reasons. It is very important to see beyond what is seen at first glance, not just looking more than looking, seeing. See beyond the political party, beyond religion, beyond the nose on your face. Do not underestimate the pain of others if you do not feel it. Do not judge the good life of the other. Do not con condemn the bad life of the other. Don't be a judge. Let us not judge the one who lacks as well as the one who exceeds him. We are on different ships looking to survive. Let everyone navigate their route with respect, empathy, and responsibility. Beautiful. And whoever wrote this, first of all, great gratitude to him or her for writing this piece. And uh, I guess in a very different way, awakening yeah. uh, different people, you know, and uh, really having this conversation. So Eddie Bai, when you, when you read this, mm -hmm. walk us through what you went through and then what are some of the things you, you believe that you can draw in from over 30 years of your own spiritual practice, your yoga practice, consciousness? What, how are you kind of interpreting this and what do you, how do you see the way forward? Well, one of the things that struck me and uh, that I mentioned in, in my email was that, um, you know, we're not in the same boat. We are in the same storm. We're also on the same ocean, you know, the same planet. So the landscape is the same for us because a, a storm comes and goes, but the, you know, the ocean always is going to be there. And, um, and sailors on the sea in a storm, storm, you know, they know that they look out for each other because the sea and nature is not kind. You know, the sea doesn't care about us and will do whatever she wants to tear boats apart. Um, and she doesn't care for gain of fish and she doesn't care for loss of life. She does her thing because she's nature. And, um, and the sailors then have to look out for each other and, and for the other boats. And that's a lot of what's happening now. We see a tremendous outpouring of care and concern and service in all sectors, whether it's feeding children or sewing masks um, or you know clapping out of windows every evening at 7 p.m. around the world, whatever people can manage, the service of doctors and truck drivers. Um, so our, you know, our country is amazing the world is amazing when it comes to crisis. Um, and, and that's definitely what we're seeing, that boats are taking on water and people are helping. And so my question was, well, you know, what about this global shift in consciousness that people talk about a lot? You know, there's gonna, nothing will be the same, everything will change. And, and I would just wonder, you know, how that happens because things are going to be different, of course, but changing consciousness it takes effort to maintain. Like you might have a shift temporarily, but to maintain it takes work and commitment to remembering this is where we were and this is where we need to be and always holding that. And so the, the positivity which I see among people who feel this way is wonderful and inspiring. And, um, and, I, and I'm also inspired by these learnings that come from the in psychology that say, you know, positive thinking, and Deepak talks about this a lot, that um, positive thinking isn't enough in and of itself. Um, the psychological studies have shown that when you just think positive, sometimes you already think that you've arrived at the place where you want to be, so you don't have the energy to apply yourself to actually get there, because you imagine. In fact, I talk about resilience quite a bit, now more than ever before. Yeah. We need to be more resilient as a society, right? Because yeah. adversity is staring at us. What is our attitude, belief, and choices we are going to make as humanity? Because the future generations are going to judge us by what actions we took today. And like you said, this is not a sprint. This is going to be a marathon, right? Yeah. We have, and we, when I did, I was, uh, I kind of 
wanted to do a 12 hour meditation and I did it from sunrise to sunset uh, on, on Saturday the evening. And the two words which came out and partly, you know, one of the words was with our meeting with the Dalai Lama when we all went to India. And the two words which came out was ahimsa, right? Nonviolence and karuna, compassion, mm. right? Beautiful. We have to, as humanity, we need have some amount of redemption. We'll have to be, maybe kind of use these two, two levers or two pillars in everything we do. So we can live in harmony and in homeostasis with all sentient beings. Right? Yeah. And that's so something which came up. If we want to live in homeostasis, we have to um, first begin to regulate our own homeostatic functions. Uh, and then we can continue to co-regulate each other. Um, but if we're not regulated, then we can't help to regulate the world or the people around us. Um, Beautiful. Absolutely. I think change is within us. Aham Brahmasmi. Like, you know, we are, we are, we got to find the God in us and self-care, right? Before we can help others. I read a great phrase, a great saying uh, that I think you'll really appreciate because you talked about the marathon. Right. And this is from the um, Aghori Vimalananda, who was the mentor of my friend, Dr. Robert Swoboda. And uh, Vimalananda said that, um, the, you know, when you're, when you're walking along a road and you're taking a long walk, the road won't get tired, but you will. <laughs> so you have to pace yourself and you have to know, you have to plan ahead and think where are the points where I might need to take a rest, I might need to take shelter, I might need to eat some food. And so all of this is a little bit of, you know, a strategic planning that you have to do to go, if we want there to be a, a big global consciousness shift and we come out of this being more loving, appreciative, compassionate, thoughtful people, then um, let me imagine this road ahead and see what am I going to need to plan for in order for that to happen, for me to be a part of that change? What do I need to plan for in my life to, to make that happen? And so that's where you take this, you know, this strategy and you put it into your positive thinking. So you're not just thinking it's all going to be you know, lotus flowers and butterflies and unicorns um, that we hope that it will be. But you know, how am I going to bring those unicorns to actually sit down at the table and stay with us, you know, instead of running off. So, um, Beautiful. And, that's, and that's the other part of that email that was about uh, a little bit of realism, maybe a little bit of even realistic pessimism that says, what if it doesn't happen um, the way I expect it to? What will I do then? Uh, and this is a big part of resilience also. Right. Um, you know, things don't always work out the way we want them to. And then how in do fact, we most of the time it doesn't, right? We have to learn to exist in the chaos and then, you know, the only change, which only thing which is constant in our life is change. Exactly. Change is inevitable every day, every moment, every second. We have to embrace impermanence, right? Yeah. And now more than ever before, it is really staring us in our face. And I think we as a generation have to realize you know, how do we respond to it? So I want to ask you a question, going back into all the, your practices, which you've been, uh, you know, I would say, on, in the forefront of yoga as a practice and science. How are, you, how are you preparing yourself? What are some of the things you have now looked at the shift and other things which you have incorporated? What is your outlook going forward, even from how you, how you went, went about teaching yoga to doing things? Have there been shifts in yourself personally over the last six weeks? Well, um, you know, like everybody else, um, what we did immediately was we brought all of our teachings online. So all of our classes are through Zoom. Mm -hmm. Uh, I made a shift that I've been wanting to make for a long time, which is we have made all of our classes completely free um, or by optional donation. And people can donate any level that they want to for the classes. And in this way, you know, there's a huge yoga community out there. And a lot of people in the yoga community, meaning just people who practice yoga, not teachers, um, are out of work. And they don't have money to pay for classes. Their yoga schools, of course, are closed down. And um, a lot of offerings on the internet um, are behind a, a paywall. So um, we, and, and a lot of people, of course, are doing free things too. I, I'm not saying we're the only ones, but one of the things we did immediately is we said, all classes are free by donation only. And um, we wanna be there to support the community that we are a part of by allowing, giving them the space to just come in and, and do as many classes as they want and be with people. So that's been great. Um, we've really enjoyed that. Every morning at 6 a.m. New York City time on Instagram, we're doing um, basically like a, a prayer service. We're chanting Ganesh mantras and Vishnu mantras, which are purifying healing mantras. And um, we ask people to put in the names of who they'd like to pray for 
in the comment section. So as we're all chanting the mantras together, you see all these names of people coming through. And for half an hour a morning, half an hour every morning, we're just getting together with 300 or 350 people and we're praying for their friends and family and for the world. And so that's, you know, that's a nice thing. We like that's that. It's beautiful. And that truly is setting an intention, right? Non-local communication. We know everything is energy. So yeah. the very fact of even uh, looking at the names coming up on the comment, thinking of them, invoking healing yeah. is, is as good as being face to face. And this, I would I have to admit, you know, when you're talking about oceans, I just thought about something. Um, you know, the, the captains of the ship, of great sailors mm -hmm. set sail, not when the storm is, when the, when the seas are calm. They, they, they set sail when it is stormiest. And the only reason they can do that is because they know how the winds blow. Wow. Right? They know how the directions go. Wow. I was thinking about the analogy we can take in this is that the leaders of countries, religious faiths, or CEOs, you know, now is the time for great leadership too, right? Because these leaders and captains or sailors can now steer the ship away from dangerous waters, right? But also look at the momentum of compassion, kindness, I use those, those winds which are coming in and say, how do I harness those winds of positive change or, 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 and adapt and, and move my ship in those directions? So I think that's also another analogy. Like even when it, the seas are the short, stormiest, the greatest sailors set sail. Right. So. I love that. And, you know, that really fits into um, the whole resiliency piece that you talk about a lot, too, in that um, part of resiliency is also stress perception. And that if you perceive a stress is going to be harmful for you, then it will be. And if you perceive a stress is going to be a growth challenge and it's going to help you um, to rise up, then it will do that also. So if we, if we look at these stormy winds you're talking about, is um, a growth challenge and a growth opportunity for us to really up our game and be there for people and be there for the world, um, then we will grow from this um, as with every big challenge we've had. But if we see even very small things in our lives as, um, as they're knocking us down, an angry email, a scowling glance from someone, you know, someone uh, seeming to not respect us, then you know, we're gonna, we're gonna feel defeated and we're gonna get angry and our nervous system is gonna respond by producing harmful stress hormones that are gonna lead to more anxiety, depression, heart disease, and all those types of things. So we change, um, we're gonna, we change our rudder that you're talking about through perception. Right, absolutely, and that's a beautiful analogy. So you've always done seva, and I think both of us have one thing in common. We always figure out every time we meet, what can we do to society? I, I love your, uh, the breathing app, so I'll put a link. Anybody who is looking for uh, a way to help themselves use, using breath, I love that app. But I want to kind of, we have a few minutes, I want to kind of decode, I mean, not decode, I mean, just really get into your book, because I want to talk about a couple of things, which one is, you know, I want to kind of, briefly touch on your, your, if you can give us kind of some principles, how, how we can use yoga and breath in current, the current climate. And I want to focus in on the first responders, the people, the essential workers, everybody from a store clerk in a grocery store has to go to work and be at their best today. What can we do with yoga? You know, what can we do with our breath? And I work very closely with the city of Phoenix, the first responders, the police and the fire department. And I'm going to give you a yoga exercise which you share. I'll put, I'll attend it, I'll attach it to this particular video. So maybe let's kind of talk about, you know, how the eight limbs of yoga are potentially very relevant today, right? And especially things like yama and niyama, which is discipline, and asana and pranayama. How is that all going to come together and potentially help us in this storm? Okay. So I think one of the primary teachings of yoga uh, and of the, you know, the Vedanta traditions as well in India, um, many of the teachings from all of the variety of, of, um, of uh, Indian thought systems is that the mind and body are one thing. You know, it's not even that they're a continuum, as, even though I use that word sometimes, but they're one thing and the mind fully inhibits the body um, and the body fully affects the mind. So you do one thing to your body, it affects your mind. You do something to your mind, it will affect your body. If you, and when you add, and when you do something with your breathing, it affects both the body and the mind at the same time because it's also filling those. So mm -hmm. breath in, the Sanskrit word for breath is prana. And in one of the ancient uh, 
uh, Hindu text, the Taittiri Upanishad, it said that prana, which is one of our bodies, one of the five, completely fills the physical body like heat fills an iron ball. Mm -hmm. So when you heat an iron ball, it's, heat, it's, it's uniformly warm. You can't distinguish heat from the iron. And you can't distinguish breath and life vital force from our body as well. So when we consciously move, we consciously breathe, and we conscious, consciously focus our awareness at a particular point in time, like say right now on the thing I'm doing, we bring together the body, the breath, and the mind all at the same place at the same time. It's grounding and focusing, and then it expands your perception because everything is now linked together. So normally what happens is our body is doing one thing, our breath is doing another, and our mind is somewhere else. I'm sitting here in front of a computer answering emails. My body's getting tired because I'm up way too late. My mind is saying, you can do a little bit more work. You should get some more done. The nervous system where the breath is is stuck in the middle and says, okay, I'm going to pump out some more adrenaline to keep him going, keep him up for a little while longer. He'll go to bed too late and he'll wake up tomorrow tired. And that's the cycle that we're in. So in yoga, we're saying, hey, body, breath, mind, let's all be on the same page for a little while, even five minutes. And that acts as a reset for our homeostatic functions in the nervous system, that part of our nervous system which restores us to balance. And that's where we strengthen resiliency in a physical nervous system and mental way like every day. So simple yoga poses, any of them will work. Um, it really doesn't matter what kind of yoga poses you do or what kind of breathing or what kind of meditation. The fact is all the things are gonna to come together to create that homeostatic reset, that anchoring within. And this is one of the questions that I was asking when I wrote my book. Why is it that you, know, you can have um, somebody with, with back pain, with stomach, with digestive problems, with anxiety, with sleep problems, or someone looking for a spiritual meaning in life, like five different people, all walk into the same yoga class, do the same poses, and they all walk out feeling better. And how is it that you can have people all around the world who have those same complaints and go to any yoga class at all and come out feeling better, even if the yogas were vastly different? Now that doesn't happen with any other type of medicine. You know, you can't go to a doctor with high blood pressure and be given medicine for, you know, diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be very specific. But yoga is a very non-specific um, treatment for a wide variety of maladies. Why? Because it's addressing the underlying mechanism of imbalance, which is that we're not integrated. Mm -hmm. When we integrate ourselves, balance is restored because what does nature like to do? Nature likes balance. Nature likes harmony. So when we support our own internal nature to restore itself, it will, and then we live in better harmony with the world and people around us as well. Beautiful. So I think, you know, the breath has been there from obviously from Hinduism, but across all ancient cultures, right? It has been chi, it's been called Kundalini, it's been called Salung in Tibetan Buddhism. So I think the breath is this vital force which has been uh, around. And I, and I like the quote from your book, which I love to read, which is Genesis 2.7. It says, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. And this is a really beautiful quote, which you picked in your book. And I think across the one thing we can all try to, if you forget how to breathe, you really are in trouble, right? Yet so much of us today are breathing like we are being chased by a lion or a tiger. <laughs> Literally the shortness of breath and using your breathing techniques to elongate the out breath, to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So I want to, if you have a few minutes, I want to kind of touch on one topic, which I know, which is your passion, which is polyvagal theory. You, you cover a lot in your book. You really have anchored the whole area of the vagus nerve as being so important. Can you touch on it briefly and why it is so important, the neural exercises which you have correlated with, you, with, uh, with the asanas and how across different cultures it's coming together? Yeah, um, so all of the um, inspiration from the polyvagal theory is from the creator of that theory, Dr. Stephen Porges. And um, he basically um, spoke about the vagus nerve, which is the longest uh, nerve moving through our body. Uh, it's the 10th cranial nerve, and it comes down from the brainstem, through our larynx, through the voice box, into the heart, the lungs, the diaphragm, into the stomach, into the liver, 
to the pancreas and the intestines, and it acts as a bidirectional nerve sending messages up to the brain, telling the brain what's happening in the body. These messages aren't only um, physiological, they're also emotional and sense oriented too. Like if you sense fear, that's gonna be transmitted from the visceral region of the gut and the diaphragm up to the brain and the brain will respond to it. If you feel love, that might come, the sensation might start in the heart and then be transmitted up through the brain as well. So we're not just talking about physical response, we're also talking about emotional and mental responses to the environment too. Um, my teacher had spoken about the vagus nerve a long time ago in the 1990s as being the nerve where the shashumna nadi, which is the most important nadi for the yogis, um, is located. And when prana or breath moves into the shashumna nadi, the central channel, then you attain uh, unity consciousness. You're no longer breathing the air of the world and coming and going with every breath, but your breath is centered within you and you are one with all. And so this was the first time I ever heard the word vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. And the first time I ever heard him say an anatomical term, uh, he spoke very little English. And so that stuck in my mind. So when I started reading about um, what the vagus nerve did many years later, like almost two decades later, it was long after he had died, um, I saw things about controlling inflammation in the body and improving heart rate variability and uh, improving uh, emotional um, uh, ability to socially connect with people um, and all these types of things. Uh, I started investigating a little. I came across Stephen Porges and um, I saw that he had identified in one of his talks that within the world religious traditions, they did a lot of practices that seemed to directly impact the functions of the vagus nerve. And he called this vagal tone. And vagal tone basically means that information is freely flowing between the body and the brain. Um, low tone, not a lot of information. So we don't get the messages right. Very high tone, the messages are clear. We're reading them properly. So for example, if I can read your facial expressions and read your vocal tone, that means that my vagus nerve has information flowing so I can perceive you properly. And if I can properly regulate my vocal tone, and use my facial expressions properly. I can express well because my vagal tone is high. And then you can hear me. So we regulate each other. If I'm talking and I see you getting bored, I might change my topic a little. So I'm gonna regulate myself to make sure that we're connecting on, on the right level. So um, what are some of the things that do this? Uh, without going into all the different religious traditions and what they do, he identified you know, four basic things. Number one is posture, that all of the different world religions use different types of posturing in their prayer. Like in Islam, you bow five times a day, for example, or the Jews rock back and forth. Then there's a um, breathing which is done. And the breathing is quite often done in concert with, with vocalization, with chanting, with, with vocal prayer, vocalized prayer. And then the last is behavior, that there are these certain behaviors that you find are, are fitting into all of these different traditions. So what does that do physiologically? Um, posture, for example, just sitting up straight, sends messages to the um, baroreceptors wrapped around the carotid arteries that are monitoring and managing blood pressure levels. So any type of postures are gonna help to manage blood pressure. Um, the bowing, the kneeling, the standing, the whirling, like the whirling dervishes. Um, or the breathing, the rhythmicity of breathing when the belly goes out and the belly comes in, sends messages from the vagal afferents in the abdominal region up through the diaphragm, up to the brain, of rhythmicity, of evenness, of steadiness, of safety. All of these, all those are the feelings you get when things are rhythmic and smooth, um, like listening to your mother's heartbeat. Um, and then the next is vocalization, is stimulating the vagal nerves in the throat as well, um, where we're expressing emotion. And behavior is the last one that he's shown that um, anger and anxiety interrupt or weaken heart rate variability, which is, a, which is how you measure vagal tone. And that gratitude, appreciation, and love are the things that are going to improve vagal tone. And I looked at those and I said, oh my God, these are the first four limbs of Ashtanga Yoga. Mm -hmm. These are behavior is yama, and vocalization is in niyama, the chanting. And then posture is asana, and then breathing is pranayama. So all of these first four practices that we do around the world of Ashtanga Yoga directly target the toning of the vagus nerve. 
Beautiful. So I found that fascinating. And then there were a lot of other things we went into, into more spiritual aspects in the book, but that was the crux of it. Um, you know, and also vagus nerve, we have to say, it's, our, it's basically our parasympathetic nervous system. So it's the relaxation response. And in relaxation, we become receptive. Right. And in the stress response, we are not receptive. You know, we are acting out against the world, either fighting against it or fleeing from it. So in order to make ourselves receptive to the world and all the lessons to learn from it, um, we need that relaxation response to become more pronounced. And what is, what is opening to the universe but receptivity? Right. That's what opening is, to become receptive. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing. As you were speaking, I'm reading this book called Natya Veda or Natya Shastras. <laughs> It is amazing because when we talk about emotion, like using the facial expressions and the, vo the, the vagal tone and the voice, and it talks about how you can use the natya or the performance of art, performance arts to really communicate and help people in grief and sorrow, bring joy. So it's amazing that the Navarasas, right? The nine emotions. So but it's written by Bharata Muni and they say, Ba is Baba, Ra is Rasa, and Ta is Thala, right? So it's interesting to see how all these ancient wisdom sciences were all connected very intrinsically, right? And yeah, so it's been a great learning for me. An amazing thing about also about that is um, when you look at, um, at the Kaptakali dancers or any of the artistic dancing traditions where facial expression is so important in the Indian arts, right. um, or the Hindu arts, that, um, and now we know that like, if you smile, even if you're not happy, that is gonna Agreed. send is the correct trigger, triggers through the vagus nerve to the brain um, that there's that there's a, potent, a possibility of happiness, you know. And so, if you change your face, the way you hold your face, it begins to impact the brain and change your emotions. Too. Absolutely. They say you put a pencil and you force yourself to kind of laugh. It actually triggers a similar response as laughing. Like in India, you know, we see in these parks, people are the laughing club, right? Hasya, they're kind of laughing in the laughing clubs. It's like yoga. So I have a few minutes. I just I want to keep, wanted to kind of cover one topic. One is, can you just briefly, if you have the five videos you shared, I want to share with the first responders in Phoenix. Do you want to give a quick one minute intro to, the, to them and uh, so that I can just add that to the- Definitely. So first of all, thank you for asking me to make those little videos for them. I'm very grateful, Adibai. This is going to be so important because, you know, if you just think about it, they're always sitting down and they're stressed out. I mean, I just don't even know what it is like to be a 911 operator and to take that call on the front line and being able to now, doesn't matter what day I've had, those 30 seconds I'm on the phone with the other person, I have to have so much of, uh, I would say, a presence, you know, to walk them through. So I, so my, anything we can do to help, I mean, it'll go a long way. So I'm very grateful to you. Well, and let's see, you know, the, the thing that will be interesting will be to get feedback from them and, and they can say whether or not these helped. Right. They didn't help, then we know we're not giving them the right thing to do. And if they you know, actually, I'm working very closely with Dr. Varshali Shukla and Pablo, who are part of what's called the Vincia Cancer Center, mm -hmm. and they offer free uh, cancer screening for first responders. So, wow. actually, we were able to send this out and get some good feedback, and I will share it with you directly. Great. So, um, we did five videos, all of them are five minutes long or under. The first one is a chair yoga practice for people who can't leave their chair because they have to be there um, with breathing. The second practice is a standing half sun salutation for people who can maybe stand up in their chair, stretch their arms and bend forward and stand back up. The third is a modified sun salutation, which works a larger range of the body. And then the fourth is like a full sun salutation practice for people who say, I can take 10 or 15 minutes to do like a full body, full breath, full concentration practice. And then the last one is a seated meditation practice just on the breath. Um, you could say a breath awareness practice that you could use in conjunction with any of the other practices. So it's sort of like a concluding thing that you can use for any, or you can use it on your own. And that's what it did. Simple. The, the wisdom of India, the wisdom of the yogis and the sages. <laughs> Thank so, you, everybody. So I want to request you one thing today. So can you conclude this session with, uh, with a chant? You, know, you're, you are very proficient in different mantras a Shanti Mantra or Ganesha, whatever, just to kind of ground this conversation and to yeah. send healing energy to the world. Yes. So we'll do um, a Shanti Mantra and we'll say it in Sanskrit and we'll say it in English also. Okay. Um, so everyone knows. Uh, should I, are you going to chant with me or should I just do that? Uh, you just chant the whole thing. I'm just going to listen in. I'm going to tune in. Okay, great. 
Sarve Bhavantu Sukinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu Makashchit Dukkabhag Bhavit Om Shanti 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 Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Tatsat Shri Krishna Paramastu So in English, maybe you can repeat after me. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from disease. May all beings be free from disease. May all look to the good in others. May all look to the good in others. May none suffer from sorrow. May none suffer from sorrow. Om peace, peace, peace. Om peace, peace, peace. Thank you, Eddie Bai. And it is, uh, once again, definitely a privilege. Our friendship over the years has something I've always cherished. And Me as anytime. Well. Anytime I'm needed uh, a piece of advice and uh, you've always been there. So for that, I'm very grateful to you, Eddie Bai. And for me, right back at you as well. Thank you. Awesome to have you as a friend. Absolutely. Breathing is one of the quickest and easiest ways to begin to downregulate our stress response and upregulate the relaxation response. Uh, but sometimes breathing and moving together can accomplish that even quicker. So we're going to do some simple movements now that are going to be linked together with breath and that's going to address your entire body mind complex all at the same time okay so quite often when we feel stress it gets stuck in the body so we need to move body move the body to release that stress so this first one is going to be a sitting down position if you're stuck in a chair all day whether in a car or truck or in an office you can start sitting up with your hands on your knees and Come a little bit closer towards the edge of your seat so your feet are on the floor. And as you inhale, you're going to reach your chest a little forward. And as you exhale, you're going to round your spine back like you're pushing into the back of your chair. Inhale, push your chest forward. Exhale, round your spine back, pushing back into your chair. Inhale, come forward. And exhale, push back, going back into your chair. I'll show you what it looks like on the side also. If you're sitting a little bit forward on your seat, inhale, push your chest forward. Exhale, round the spine back. Inhale, bring the chest forward. Exhale, round the spine back. And then inhale, sit straight. And exhale. Okay, the next one, we're going to bring the thumbs onto your shoulders. And as you inhale, you're going to lean your body to the right. And exhale, lean your body to the left. Inhale, lean to the right. Exhale to the left. Do this four times. Inhale to the right. And exhale to the left. Inhale to the right. Exhale to the left. Inhale back to center and relax the arms down. Move the shoulders in circles a few times. Now interlace your hands and bring the backs of your hands under your chin. As you inhale, lift your chin back and push your hands a little into the chin. Exhale, push the arms straight up in the air and breathe here, one. Pull the belly a little in, two. Bring your head down. And exhale, the arms down. We'll do that one more time. Interlace the hands, push your palms forward for a moment. Bring the hands underneath your chin. And then you're going to lift the head back and open your elbows out to the side. Exhale, push the arms up. Stretch up. Lift the head forward and breathe. One, two, move the arms a little back. And exhale the arms down onto the knees and rotate the shoulders. Squeeze them up towards the ears. 
and go the opposite way. Okay. And the only other position we need to do now is to do a twisting position to get the spine moving in all directions. So if you have an armchair here, or you can put your hand on your, the seat of your chair that you're sitting on, put your left hand on your knee, the right knee, twist your body towards the right. You can also look over your left shoulder when you do this and lift the chest higher, that feels quite good. Breathe here, twisting. The head can be in either position. And then come back to center. Your left hand comes next towards the hip, your right hand on your left knee. Lift the chest, twist to the side and breathe. One, two, and three. Come back to center. Relax the chin down for a moment. Inhale, lift the chin up and look a little up. Exhale, the head down a little, the chin a little down. Inhale, the head up. And exhale, come to center. Now we're gonna inhale for a count of five. And exhale for a count of five. Inhale for a count of five. And exhale for a count of five. Inhale for a count of five. Exhale for a count of five. Inhale for five and pause for a moment. Exhale for five. Relax the breathing and just sit quietly, feeling the body, feeling the breath. And see if you feel a little bit more centered back within yourself, anchored within yourself, and a calmer, more present state of mind. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Okay, so this is a short five minute sitting down yoga and breathing practice and you can do this anytime during the day that you feel that you this next practice is called the half sun salutation uh, again it's breathing and moving together so it works the whole body mind complex um, it's soothing for the nervous system and it's also strengthening for the core muscles and creates flexibility in the legs so i'm going to talk you through all of the movements and um, you can follow along. Of course, your body might look a little bit different than mine does when you do these, but you do them the best you can. So the first movement is inhaling your arms up over your head, stretching up towards the ceiling. And the second movement, you're gonna exhale and swan dive your arms out to the side and begin to bend forward. Bend your knees, place your hands down on the floor near your feet. You can bend the knees as much as you need to, and then inhale, Lift your chest forward and straighten the knees a little. Exhale, bend the head back down and let the knees bend. Inhale, stand up, stretch the arms over your head. And exhale, the arms straight forward. Okay, so you don't need any special equipment, any special clothes or yoga mat or anything for these. It's quite simple. Any place where you can breathe and move at the same time, if you're wearing sneakers and jeans, doesn't matter. Inhale, the arms up. Exhale, swan dive open to the side and begin to bend your knees as you come forward and rest your head down. Just relax the head, relax the shoulders. Inhale, straighten the head up a little and lift your head forward. You can also keep your hands on your shins if you like. And then exhale, bend your knees and relax back down. Inhale, the head comes forward. Stand all the way up, straightening your legs. And exhale, the arms down. We'll do that two more times. Inhale the arms up. Exhale, fold over the legs, bend the knees when you need to and relax the head down. Inhale the head up, straightening the knees. Exhale the head down, bending the knees, relax the head. Lift the chest forward. Inhale, stand up, the arms come over the head. And exhale the arms down. Now, if you'd like to try this with your legs straight the whole time, you can also. 
That would be inhaling the arms up over the head. Exhale, swan dive the arms out, bend forward, bring your hands by your feet and your head down. Inhale your head forward. Exhale the head down. One more time, inhale the head forward. Come all the way up, the arms over the head. Exhale the arms by your side. Last time, inhale the arms up. And straight legs or bent legs, you choose. Exhale, open the arms and come down. Put the head down. Inhale, lengthen forward. Exhale, bend the head down. Inhale, the head up. Reach your arms back and up, swan diving up. Exhale, the arms down. Spread your feet a little apart. Relax the shoulders, close the eyes. Breathe a comfortable inhale and a comfortable exhale. Maybe just a little bit longer than normal. An extended inhale, an expanded exhale. Enjoy the feeling of the breath in the body. Let the mind relax into the body, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your legs supporting you, feeling your hips balanced over the legs belly and the spine relaxed but tall. Feel the arms resting out from the shoulders and the fingers and the palms of the hands relaxed. Feel the breath calmly in your throat. Feel your scalp relaxing and the muscles of the face softening. Any tension just drifts away out from the body. And anchoring within yourself a long inhale and a slow exhale. You can open the eyes. Okay, so that's another short practice. That's a, about a four minute practice of the half sun salutation. You can do it anytime during the day when you need to. Um, to refresh the body, refresh the mind, and to calm the nervous system. So this next practice is a modified sun salutation. There are many ways of doing sun salutations. Uh, this is a particular version which will stretch basically your whole body. Uh, again, you don't need any special equipment or any special clothes. You can do this with sneakers on or shoes on. If you just need to get like a bigger stretch for the body than what we just did with the half sun salutation. So again, this is a modified version. There are many, many different types, uh, but this is an easy go-to version if you just need to stretch out a little during the day. And again, focus and re-anchor yourself. So standing with the feet together, we're gonna inhale the arms up, forward and up over the head. Exhale, swan dive the arms open and out, coming down into a forward fold. Now just lift your head up and step your left leg way far back behind you and put the knee on the floor. You can keep your toe flexed under if you like and lift your chest up. If you want to come up onto your fingertips, you can. And this is nice for stretching the front of the thigh and the front hip flexor. And then from here, you're going to lift your back knee up off the floor. Just push yourself back into downward facing dog. Stretch your chest towards your legs for a moment. And then we'll come forward with the same foot that we went back with. So we're going to bring your left foot forward a big step up. Put your back knee on the floor. Now you're stretching through your right hip flexor. You can come up on the fingertips if you like. Breathe here for a moment. And then you're gonna step forward again. Put your head down towards the legs. Inhale, stand up. Arms come over the head. Exhale, the arms down. Okay, there are also versions of these where you do cobra or upward facing dog and we'll do that type in the next video. We're gonna do this three times. Inhale the arms up. Exhale, swan dive forward. Let the head rest down. As you lift your head up, step your right leg back. A big step back, you can point the toe if you like or keep it flexed under. Stretch the front of your hip. And then from here, after a breath or two, you're gonna push back to downward facing dog. 
Lift your hips and put the head down. Breathe here for a moment. And then we'll step the right foot forward, the back knee down, lifting your chest up. Breathe here for a moment, stretching the front of the hip. And then exhale, step forward with the head down. Inhale, come up, arms over the head. Exhale, the arms down. Inhale, the arms forward and up. Exhale, the arms open and come down. Step your left foot back, lift the chest. Maybe it feels a little bit more open now. And then exhale, push back to downward dog and push your chest down towards your legs. Bring your left foot forward. Put the right knee onto the floor, come up on the fingertips. And then you're gonna exhale, step forward, then head down towards your legs. Inhale, stand up, arms over the head. Exhale, the arms down. Do one more time. Inhale, the arms up. And exhale, swan dive forward. Inhale, the head up and step your right leg back. Stretch the front of your hip. And then you're gonna push back to downward facing dog. Stretch through the shoulders. And your right foot a big step forward, the back knee on the floor. Lift the chest, stretch the front of your hip. Exhale, bend forward, stepping your left foot to your right. Inhale, coming up, arms over the head and exhale, stand straight. Separate your feet, breathe, and exhale. Long inhale, and exhale, relax the breathing. Do a little body scan, relaxing through all the parts of the body, letting your awareness settle back within. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes after taking a little standing rest. Okay, so that is a modified sun salutation. Again, another simple five minute practice that you can use to get your day going, um, to energize yourself in the middle of the day, or even warm yourself up before you do any other exercise. Okay. In the next video, we'll do one more variation, a little bit more of a challenging variation of the sun salutations. In this video, we're going to do one more version of the sun salutation. This one's a little bit more challenging for those who uh, are used to some energetic exercise. Uh, this one will be useful for you. So I'll talk you through it, and you're gonna see a lot of the same elements. The only thing we're adding in is one push-up position and a cobra pose. So standing with the feet together and the body straight, inhale the arms straight forward up over the head, lengthen through your ribs, as you exhale, open your arms out to the side, bend forward, putting your hands down by your feet, bend your knees if you need to, and lifting your head down. As you inhale, lengthen your chest forward, and now you're gonna step your feet back one by one, coming into a high plank pose. And then from here, you're gonna exhale down into a low plank. And you can either stay here, or lie down on your belly, turn your toes towards each other, and then inhale, push down on the hands and lift the chest up. You don't have to come too high. Stay here for a moment, breathe. And now tuck your toes under and come back on your knees and push your hips back in the air into downward dog. We'll stay here for three breaths. One, breathe through your nose. Two, and three. Look at your hands and step your feet forward one by one, lifting the head up. Exhale, bend the head back down towards your legs. Inhale, stand up, bringing the arms out over your head. Exhale, the arms down. Okay, we're gonna do three of these. Inhale, the arms forward and up. 
Exhale, swan dive, your arms out and bend down. Come into your forward fold. Inhale the head up. Now this try it time, try bending your knees and just hop your feet back into a high plank pose. Lift out of the shoulders a little, and then exhale, come down into a low plank. You can also lie on the floor. Bring the toes together, rest your spine, and then inhale, come into upward facing dog or cobra. Look forward, lift up through the chest a little. Okay, if you feel any back discomfort, you can just come into a low position like this with your chest a little off the floor. Tuck your toes, push back over the hands and knees into downward facing dog and breathe. One, two, three. Good. Bend the knees and look at your hands. Inhale, try to jump both of your feet right up to the hands and then straighten the knees and lift the chest. Exhale, bend the head down towards your legs. Inhale, stand up, reaching your arms out to the side over your head. And exhale, the arms down. Do one more of those. Yakum, inhale the arms up. Dwe, exhale, bend down. Trini, inhale the head up. Exhale, jump your feet back to a high plank and then lower down to a low plank. Inhale into upward dog or a low cobra, lift the chest. And exhale, push back to downward dog and breathe. One, two, Bend the knees and jump your feet forward. Lift the chest, straighten the arms and legs. Exhale, put the head towards the legs and bend your knees if you need to. Inhale, come up, arms up to the side over your head. Exhale, the hands down by your side. Through the nose, a long inhale. And a long exhale. One more long inhale, and exhale. Okay, so this is the um, third type of sun salutation we did. We did a half sun salutation, a modified sun salutation, and then we did this one full sun salutation. All are good versions, depending on your needs and your capabilities. You can do this one anywhere from three to 12 times, depending on your endurance levels. Always breathe through the nose. As soon as you start breathing through the mouth, you know that you have over exceeded your aerobic capacity and it's time to stop and rest. Uh, in the next video, we'll show some simple finishing poses you can do after the sun salutations if you'd like to incorporate more breathing practice. This last practice can be done sitting on the floor it can be done sitting up on a pillow or some blocks. It can also be done sitting in a chair. Either of those are fine. Your legs can be, I'm in half lotus right now. Um, of course, I've been doing yoga for a while, so that's comfortable for me. Some people might be more comfortable in a cross-legged position with your legs like this. Uh, whichever one you're choosing, sitting on the floor, a pillow, or a chair, cross your legs. If you're in a chair, of course, your feet will be straight. And you are going to hold your wrist behind your back. Inhale a breath and exhale, bend forward, putting your head towards the floor. Doesn't matter how far you go. As far as your head naturally goes, that's how far you are going to go. If your head doesn't touch the floor, you can put your hands in front of you if that's more comfortable. Reach the hands forward and keep your chin down. And we breathe five times. One, two, three, four, and five. Walk your hands back in towards you, and now you're gonna keep your hands on the floor behind you, just about 12 inches back or so. You're going to lift your chest, put the head back, and breathe. One, 
Two, if you feel any neck discomfort, keep your chin towards your collarbones. Keep the chest lifted. Three, four, and five. And then you're gonna come to sit straight. You're gonna keep your hands on your knees and you're gonna breathe five slow breaths. Inhaling and exhaling through the nose. Inhale. And exhale. Inhale. To a count of four. Pause for two. And exhale for six. Inhale for four. Pause. Exhale for six. One more, inhale for four. Pause. Exhale for six. Do one more on your own. And then let the breathing relax into any natural rhythm. Check in with yourself. Feel the calmness of your mind, the evenness of the breathing. And if you're able to, you can lie down on your back and rest for two or three minutes or lean back in your chair and just rest calmly for two or three minutes. And if you have a lot of thoughts in your mind, you can think yourself, anything I need to think about, I can think about after I'm done resting for these two or three minutes. And then do a little bit of a body scan, just moving your awareness through every part of your body and telling each part of your body to relax. And after two or three minutes, you can get up, feeling completely refreshed and go about your day. This is a good way to finish any of the sun salutation variations that we did.